go. Part four. The last part. There's a whole lot more of us in this room this evening, this afternoon, so I want this morning, sorry. So I want to I want to ask you to preach with me as I'm preaching. Hey Dion, don't leave me all quiet and outside like, like a Jehovah's Witness. Be with me, preach with me, help me lift the preacher up. So I know that I'm preaching to a to people that are listening this morning. Amen? Amen. And uh, I know some guys say, hey, I'm listening so well, Craig, that's why I'm quiet. Well, don't listen too well. Rather talk well with me. Amen? Amen? Amen. Oh, that, that's, that's better. All right. So week one, the world's money says, chase me. God's money says, earn me. Week two, we did the world's money says, hoard me. God's money says, save me. Remember that? Week three, the world's money says, squander me. God's money says, spend me. I hope if you struggled with spending at this last week, was thank you, Ryan. You opened it. You took a sip just to test it. And this morning, week four, the last part of this, the world's money says, worship me. God's money says, give me. Who remembers the 1987 floods? Yes. You're going to be old enough to remember that. 1987. And uh, I was at Marysburg College. No, Marysburg College. I was, I was at Marysburg College. What am I talking about? My, my, my matric year. And um, I lived in Marysburg. I grew up in Marysburg. Born in Durban, but grew up there. And I remember our fields and the field of Merkiston, the primary school I was at, were so full of water that there were pictures of the, of, the, of the students at that time canoeing across the fields, the rugby fields. And uh, I remember that was quite an, an amazing thing. As a matter of fact, a friend of mine lived right in the bottom of West Street and his, his, uh, his house was right on the bottom of West Street where, where the doozy is. And they had to evacuate their house uh, because they thought their house was going to get taken. But it's, West Street's quite steep and they were about 50 meters up. So fortunately their house was... Was, uh, was okay. But those are memories I have of 1987. And then again, remember a few months ago, we had some flooding out here. Remember that? Yeah. My kids were happy. They didn't go to school for a while. <laughs> and, uh, um, and that was quite amazing. It was quite scary because water was going everywhere that it shouldn't. Amen. Amen. In 1913, in a place called Columbus, Ohio, in America, they had a major flood. As a matter of fact, it was the biggest flood they ever had, 1913, and uh, there was a whole lot of stuff going on. There was $100 million worth of damage that year because of that, that flood. And uh, um, because obviously global warming was already happening in 1913. And so, oh no, you couldn't blame it on that, but you had to blame it on some other stuff. I'm going down a rabbit, rabbit hole here and a naughty one, and I shouldn't. Anyway. 1913 and it completely wrecked the town and many 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 uh, um, uh, uh, counties they call them in that area and a hundred million dollars worth of damage because of what this flooding had done and what they did after that they bandied the whole town the whole the whole town together and they put in two million dollars they raised funds two million dollars and they built what was called let me get this right here a flood control system they built a flood control system that to this day has worked over 1500 times and what it does is it takes the water instead of going into places it shouldn't it takes it into places that it should and some places that it needs water it is helpful for them and the other places that don't want the water it's helpful for them but it had to be planned and had to be strategized on how to do that and it's and it saved many many counties matter of fact i wrote some figures here uh, uh, 47,000 properties in five counties are, are, are protected through the system. $7.3 billion in property value. Six hospitals, 60 schools in, and colleges, 14 wastewater treatment plants. Don't you wish they'd done something here for ours a few months ago? Nine water treatment plants and a million people that use those facilities. That's what this flood water system does. Did you know that money is a very, very similar thing? Worship me, 
or give me. You see, when, when we worship money, it's like a flood comes into our lives. Now, you might go, geez, Craig, my money's not like a flood. I wish it was. I wish I won the, I won the, 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 the lotto. No, the tata my chance, tata my millions. I want to encourage you, if you do that, do that. Don't take chances. God's not into chance taking. Amen? And you're just making some people very rich. Anyhow. That was for free. <laughs> Most people that win the lotto end up losing their money. Do you know that? 99% of the people. Because they don't know how to operate with money. The Father wants to teach you how to make money. But we go, don't worry about that, God. I'm going to bypass and tatter my chance to tatter my millions. And the father says, no, that's not actually not my heart for you, boy. I want, or girl, I want to teach you. Listen to what this guy up there with the thankful, grateful, not stressed on his t-shirt is saying. I mean, sometimes I think it's thankful, grateful, stressed. And Dawn's going to tell me, stop it, babe. Sometimes it's thankful or being ungrateful. Sometimes it's not being thankful. Amen? So, money when we get money when we worship money and it gets so what happens it causes see when when water starts to get to a place where it shouldn't be it causes all kinds of problems there all kinds of death and decay and trauma and destruction but when it goes to where it should go it actually brings life and health Who's with me? When we take money and we worship money, see, we end up hoarding and we end up holding on to it. And what it does, it causes death and destruction and decay in our hearts and our minds. Because we begin to worship the thing we shouldn't be worshiping. Instead of letting, having some kind of control system that allows money to flow out of our lives into places it should, what happens? It ends up blessing not only others, but Jesus said it's more blessed to give than to receive. I don't know about you, but I believe that God is not a liar. And when Jesus says something, he means it. But some of us need to learn and realize actually it is more blessed to give, and to give than to receive. Because we're so afraid of giving because we think, woohoo, I need this power. And the Father says, actually, you will learn how blessed it is to give, my boy, when you begin to do that in earnest. Amen. So when we allow money to flow out like it should, and we set up some sort of control system, it actually becomes a blessing not only for others, but for us. Amen. And all of us have been involved in floods and all of us have been involved in the, the trauma that is involved in that because that we have not planned properly. Now, you can blame me whoever you want when it comes to it to a cranny, but when it comes to your money, you can only blame you. Who's with me? And I can only blame me. Our money is much the same. Just a lot of water, just as a lot of water can be used to produce life or destroy it, so can money. When money is worshipped, it becomes blocked up and hoarded, resulting in greed. But when we allow it to overflow where it is needed, there is, there is, the result of that, generosity is fruit, life and growth. When money is not allowed to go anywhere... It can result in damage to our own hearts and a withholding of blessing from others, which I've just said. The amazing thing is when money is allowed to flow in healthy ways, because some places our money flows is, can be unhealthy. Just like flood waters, there is always more than enough. Amen? This is what, this is what the practice of giving does in comparison to worshiping money. All right, and that's why it's so crucial. 2 Corinthians 9. Let's read this together. It's a famous passage on finances. Remember this. Interesting. When Paul writes the words, remember this, what do you think he's trying to communicate to us? Remember this. When last did you read 2 Corinthians 9, 6 to 15? Because he tells me to remember this. So if God says, Craig, what is 2 Corinthians 9, 16 about? And I go, actually, I don't know. He says, son, I want you to remember this. Amen. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. Be careful when you're at the, at the, car, at the robot and you're feeling to give to the, to the guy on the side of the road because, you make, because you're feeling bad. And he's making you feel bad. 
That's, that's called giving under compulsion, which is not what God wants you to do. See, it doesn't happen in the church only. It happens elsewhere. When you get made to feel guilty about not doing something. Who's with me? One day I was at the cargo, at the robot somewhere here on the bluff. And the guy comes up and he says, hey, please, come on, man. And I'm, I'm like, hey, listen, I've got nothing on me. I don't have, and he said, come on, just one, I just, I'm short one buck. I'm short one rand. So I said, so are you saying if I give you one rand, you're not going to, you're going to leave this place? And I, uh, so then you, then I said, you're lying. You're not short one rand. You're trying to make me feel bad. Amen. And we don't want to give under compulsion or reluctantly. For our God loves a cheerful giver. That word cheerful in the Greek is hilarion, which means hilarious. When last did you give hilariously? <laughs> You know what that means when you're laughing. Now I know when you give from your neighbor's wallet you can laugh. <laughs> Hilarious. When you find something, <laughs> that's how the Lord wants us to sow. We're so full of joy because we know that God is a provider. Amen? Amen. All right. And then he says, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, Having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food. Some people in this hall are eating their seed. Because he gives seed to the sower and bread for food. You're supposed to be eating the bread, not the seed. Amen? And every month, God gives you and me seed. And we, ha we need the wisdom of God to find out what is bread and what is seed. Because if we're eating our seed, it ain't going to become bread. Yeah. Who's with me? Yeah. Verse 10, now he, I already read that. All right. Increase the store of your seed and enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Interestingly, that God wants to increase your store of seed. You see that? But when we're faithful with the seed we have and we're sowing it, he says, son, I'm going to increase your store of seed. But when I don't care about anything, I go, I don't really care. I'm just munching my seed. And the father says, then I can't increase your seed. Matter of fact, you've got a storehouse of seed. He says here, increase your store of seed. God wants to increase your bank account that you have a savings account that's actually used for seed. Amen. Most of us don't even have saving accounts for ourselves. Forget about for others. Anyway, verse 11. You will be rich, enriched in every way so that by, be, you can be generous on every occasion and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people but also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. When we are giving our tithes and offerings, we are performing a service. How's that? That's just profound. The service that you perform. Verse 13. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves. How's that? You have proved yourselves. So there's something in our giving that is proving. Orbs, can you take, it's a slight ring on the mark. I think it's maybe in the mids you can just cut some of those. Thanks my friend. But not too much. When we give, we're actually proving something. How profound is that? He says, this service by which you have proved yourselves. God doesn't mind you trying to do things to prove yourself to him or to others. Who's with me? You're not doing it to be a son. You're already a son. You're doing it to show proof of the faith that you carry in God and his promises. Who's with me? As a matter of fact, Paul, I don't know if it's on here. Uh, um, no, it's not. But he talks about, the, the, uh, he talks about how we show our love for others by what we do yeah. to others and to him now I'm wrecking that scripture it's not exactly what it says but I'll give it some other time verse others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel I love that so there's an, there's an obedience that accompanies the confession of the gospel I confess Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior now the Father says right son now I want you to be obedient in this area of finances and prove yourself and, and show how much you love people by giving amen. amen but some of us just stop at you're going to heaven there's not, nothing else really in here Craig it's just outside the fact that I'm going to heaven is there I mean there's nothing else I've got to read and no, now you're going to heaven. Whew, thank you, God. I'll see you next week. 
accompanied to your confession of the gospel and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, all right, let's keep, no, no, in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out because of this unsurprising, so, sorry, the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Big point number one, we've got a couple of points to be done. Big point number one, by the way, insurance is paying us out for a couple of speakers at Blue. Remember that one Sunday we had a bit of smoke came out of our speakers? It wasn't the vibe you worship, it was the speakers going faulty. And some of our fans, you can see there's one fan there. We haven't got them switched off just to punish you. They're not switched off there just to irritate you. They don't work. And so that one there is not swinging. It is. And that one there. So we try to get some fans, as many as we can. But those fans are being replaced this week. Insurance is paying us out, just in case you are wondering. And the one in the kitchen, because it is warm. You can feel that. All right. Big point number one. It starts with gratitude. Gratitude thankful grateful blessed some of us should wear a t-shirt that says not thankful ungrateful stressed who wants one of those thankful grateful blessed it starts with gratitude my friends gratitude is a form of worshiping God there's plenty of times I find myself mm, complaining but I know it's only me, not, of you, not you guys. 2 Corinthians 9, Paul says, And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, having all that, you, all that you need, you are able to abound in every good work. Where has God blessed you lately? Where has He given you all that you need lately? You will be enriched in every way. You will be enriched. You know, a lot of us, we go, Well, Craig, I was retrenched three months ago. I've got nothing to be grateful for. Where do you live? Well, I stay in a little granny flat. Well, great stuff. There's some people that live in the bushes on the beach. Amen. Amen. You got clothes that you're wearing, and you, you, we, most of us sitting in this hall, I would venture to say 99.9. .9, maybe there's a 0.1 percent person here that has things that people would dream only dream of. Amen. But very often, our our, our words are not filled with grat gratitude they're filled with other things and we, we actually forget about where has the father blessed me god where have you blessed me there's plenty of times i end up speaking to dawn i, I catch my I'm, I'm actually complaining here and she'll tell me you're complaining and then she says come let's pray with some soaky music and we're praying i don't, don't want to pray i just want to moan <laughs> i just want to miff about stuff amen I don't know where I'd go and blow space if it wasn't for dawn. Oh, Craig, you're supposed to be a pastor. I don't know what I am. All I know is I want to be faithful with what God has given me. Amen? And not to have too many of those down times. And if I do hit a wobbly, it doesn't, mustn't stop what I'm actually doing anyhow. Father says, son, you might be going to the Valley of Baca, but don't live there. Don't stay there. Don't put your tent there. Get up, my boy, and keep walking. Amen? Begin to lift your hands. Why don't we lift our hands together like this this morning? Just lift our hands, close our eyes, and say, Jesus, Jesus thank, you thank you for everything for that you have given me. Amen. 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 I want to encourage you. Maybe we need to be doing that every day with our wives or if you're single by yourself. Amen. Amen. Lift your hands and say, Father, thank you for what you've given me today. Thank you for my breath. Thank you for my clothes. Thank you for my job. Thank you for my friends and family. God, thank you for the wonderful things you've given me. Amen. There's some people in prison right now, in dungeons, locked away in darkness somewhere in the world that they shouldn't even be there it's an injustice amen everything stripped from them number two giving is a major act of trust giving is a major act of trust it is saying god i trust you more than the amount of rands in my bank account it is saying i'm going to put you first lord and trust you for my needs and that is scary many christians say yes to trust in Jesus in every of their lives except with their money it is like the final holdout isn't that the case often amen it's one of the most common areas where we look to hold back or cut back however if we trust God as our savior if we believe God is good and faithful and true then we can trust God too when he says giving is good Amen. Many people, many people, uh, believers, 
They trust God for everything else, but man, finances, don't touch that. Now, we've all been through some stuff, and you've watched stuff on TV sometimes, and maybe some guys have manipulated and said stuff about money that they shouldn't have said, and all that is incorrect and wrong, and, and, and the Lord is not happy about it. Amen? But we don't take our previous experience and squash it into our, into our future theology. Amen? It's the people that have, have been divorced, they live with their boyfriends and girlfriends because they've been divorced. They're Christians, they've been divorced, they're both carrying pain. So now we just live together and hopefully that pain kind of, you know, the whole, what, what do you, wow, what are you doing? At the end of the day, you're taking your past hurt and you're pushing it into your future. Remember this, my friends, you reap what you sow. If you're going to sow seeds of pain into the previous, into the next relationship, I promise you, whether you get married or not, it's going to keep manifesting the same thing. You have to start this relationship the right way. Learn from the past. Learn from the things that you made. I remember speaking to someone once they were married. Yeah. And they were talking about their ex-husband. And they were miffing about what the person was like. And I'm going, man alive. Let's say you were 1% wrong and he was 99% right. Whatever wrong and right is, those are variables. Just take ownership of your 1% and stop miffing about his 99 to the pastor. Amen. Amen. Just learn from your 1%. You can't change that person, but change you. Jesus, uh, uh, well, she's close to Jesus. <laughs> Dawn didn't marry me to make me the husband that she wants for the rest of her life. She married me so she could become the wife that God's called her to be for me. Yeah. Amen. I didn't marry Dawn to force her into a mold to become a mini Craig. You see, in the divorce courts, there's irreconcilable differences. Why? Because she couldn't be what I wanted, and I won't be what she wants. And the father says, son, it's not about what she wants. What do I want for you in that marriage? You just be a good husband boy. You just love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And, and girl, you just respect your husband and honor him as you honor me. Amen. Amen. Don't try and change him to become what you want him to become. I remember many years ago, someone said, someone said, the father said to her, they're having an argy bargy and her husband. They led a church called Glenridge. And the father said, that, heart, that, heart, that garden is my garden in her heart. In his heart, sorry. Don't jump into that garden and try and pull out weeds. It's my garden. I'll weed that garden. You just pray. You're going to pull out stuff you shouldn't be pulling out. There's some weeds I might want to leave there for a while. For a reason. Likewise, the other way around. You don't go jump into her garden of her heart and pull out those things. It's my garden. I tend to that garden. You just love her, honor her, and lead her to me. Amen. But if you can't take the past pain and fit it around your new relationship, and both of you start walking like, you know, here's my bandage, here's my bandage. Don't touch that. I won't touch that. Oh, okay, okay. I promise you marriage is not going to solve that. It's not going to solve that. So then we should never get married, Craig. No, break up. Take the bandages off and get healed. Or change the way you're doing things. Amen? Oh, Craig, it sounds rough. It's not really. I promise you. It just takes faith. Amen? I went off on marriage there. Major act of trust. What was I talking about? I don't even remember. You know, when people say, I'm at the gym, and they'll say, hey, where's your other half? I will correct them and say, Dawn is on my other half. Sometimes I don't, sometimes I just ignore it. But if the person is the right space in the right place, I'll say something. Dawn is on my other half. She's my other whole. When you put two halves together, they eat each other up. Yeah. Amen. It's not my other half. We're two holes together that make each other whole. We don't get married to, to complete each other. Jesus completes me. Dawn doesn't complete me. I don't complete Dawn. Jesus completes Dawn. But we come together and we partner together and we love each other for the best, at the best of our ability, whatever quirks and warts and all. Amen. For the plan that God has for us, for the purpose of the plan that he has for our future. Amen. Anyway, all right. I digress, but we keep going. I only got five pages left. Who clapped? I like that. 
Next week, you can sit in the front. So just, okay, plan number, th- number three. In fact, this is my last point. We've got a few points inside of this one. Number three, plan your generosity. All right, so one starts at gratitude. Two, giving is a major act of trust. It really is. We have to trust God when it comes to finances. Now we're going to get some, get very practical here. Listen to this. Plan your generosity. When we make a plan, we give generously with joy. When we do not plan, that is when our commitments feel like a weight. Giving is good, it is meant to be fun, that is why it is important to plan. You see, God wants us to plan our giving. I want to encourage you, when the offering basket goes around and, you know, and it, uh, um, it, 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 you know, you, you, you grab your wallet, it's the only time you give, you reach for whatever's inside there, you pull it out, you toss it in. Now, at least you're doing something. But the problem is it's not planned, it's very unplanned. And most things in life, when they're unplanned, they don't go well. When you plan to fail, you fail to plan. Who's heard that before? Amen. And plan takes action. So a lot of people don't plan their giving. They just, on the spur of the moment, try and fulfill some sort of obligation. But they never, and then you open your wallet, you realize, see, I've got nothing in you. And you're like, oh my gosh, here comes the guy around of this thing. And he's, he, uh, uh, uh. And then you bluff, put something in, then pull out a 20, then put it back in. <laughs> So in Genesis 4, Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. I've got a whole lot of notes here. I might just bounce through some stuff. So you might, guys, I'm not supposed to follow me. That, and Cabel, uh, Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. Why did God make, the God say to Cain, uh, to Abel, you keep flocks and, and to Abel, you work the soil? No, I believe it was just part of their characters. It was just part of what they did. Wasn't God gave one to another and one to another? Cain worked the soil. Abel kept flocks. That's the way it was. Then it says, in, this, in the course of time, say this with me, in the course of time. All right. Cain brought some of the fruit. Say some of the fruit. Of the soil as an offering to God. Okay, so you got Cain, in the course of time, some of the fruit. Can you see the wishy-washiness there? All right. Cain. Now you got Abel on the other side. Well, listen, verse 5. Do I have it up there? Yes. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with joy. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. Oh, because God told Abel to care the flock so he could do the whole blood sacrifice and all that. And he just had the soil or the plants and God didn't want plants. So now, now that's very spiteful of God then. So you do that and you do that and you do that. When you bring your offering, I'm only going to mark yours and not yours. No, that wasn't the point. The point's not what, what they offered. It's how and when they offered it. So we see there, it says the Lord looked. So you see, that's the, what happens at the end. But th- take a look at the beginning there. In the, verse 3, in the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits. In the course of time, some of the fruits. So in the course of time, there is no real plan. It's just, when it happened, it happened. In the course of the time, as the offerings boss goes around, I'll stick my wallet and I'll pull it out, throw it in. It, there's no plan. It's just in the course of time, some of the fruit. So some stuff, maybe walk past, there's a whole lot of stuff. Like, mm, I'll grab that and I'll grab that and I'll grab that. In a packet, checkers packet, recyclable, I'm sure. And went and gave it to God. Look at Abel. And Abel also brought an offering. Okay, let's see what he did. Fat portions. Ooh. The fat portions were the best portions. See the difference? Some of the stuff, the fat portions. Different. He brought the best parts. Cain didn't bring the best parts of it. He just brought some of the stuff that he was farming. Whereas Abel brought the fat portions, the best portion of the offering. And then it says, from some of what? The firstborn. Firstborn means there's a timing to it. I've got two kids. One is a firstborn. means time. There's a time difference. See, time is very important when it comes to planning. So Abel... Firstborn, there was a specific time and the best part. Cain, in the course of time, in some of the time, he brought some of the stuff. So God looks at Abel with favor. Why? Because Abel says to God, you are so important to me. I'm going to, at the, at a, at the right time, I'm going to bring you the best thing. Abel, Cain goes, eh, whatever. If I've got some time and when I think about it, I'm going to bring you what I bring. See the difference? Faith. Faith pleases God. Lack of faith, lots of faith. Didn't cost him much, 
cost him much. When he felt like it, even if he didn't feel like it, at the right time he did it. Who's with me? Can you see the difference? Timing is everything. And of course, the first portion, the best portion. So we're going to look at tithing quickly. A few minutes. I want to spend some time unpacking this because in my mind, I have, I have many, 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 many friends that lead different churches, not only in this city, in this country, but also around the world. And churches that have a high rate of tithes always seem to be way more prosperous, can do more, flow more. There's much more kingdom work that gets done because people are tithers. In churches where the tithes are low, you have the very opposite. So you can say, someone can say, I don't believe in tithing. It's an Old Testament thing, Craig. I'm not under the law anymore. And believe me, I'm a grace guy. This is called grace life. We planted grace life 14 years under the grace message because we love the message of grace so much that we are no longer under the law. I can preach that just as good as anyone. And so I can stand with you and say, yep, we definitely don't tithe because of the law. Amen. But I can also tell you as a pastor that the church suffers when people don't tithe. I bring an offering. I don't tithe. I promise you your offering is not 10%. It's way, lo way lower than 10%. Amen. And I believe if you look at the whole gambit of the, of the Bible or the, 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 the ethos, not, not, not the word, the tithing finds itself from, right from Abraham, right when he tithed to Melchizedek, right down to the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 7. That there, is, there, is, there is a place for tithing when it comes to what God does in the local church that is very helpful. And when you remove that, and I've seen it happen over 40, maybe 20 years, when you take away that thing, the church suffers badly. And so you've got to have a good theology and you've got to have people in the church that tithe. Not because you want their money, but because God wants to do something in that local church that takes money. Amen. Who's with me? Amen. I like what you said. Amen. The only person. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yes. One Corinthians nine, Paul says, "Don't you know that those who serve in the temple get their food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar share in what is offered at the altar?" What's what's Paul referencing? Old Testament, is he not? So he's talking about the Old Testament system of the priests and the sacrifices. This is New Testament. This is Paul, the man of grace, who preached the gospel of grace. He says, don't you know that those who serve in the temple get their food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar share in what is offered at the altar? Okay. Then he says, in the same way. Say, in, in the, the same, way. same way. Listen to this. Tithing is not New Testament, Craig. You don't have to tithe the New Testament. Okay, well, look what Paul says here. Look at this. In the same way, the Lord has commanded. That's quite a strong word. That those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. So therefore, there is inference and there is precedent that there are full-time pastors, preachers, teachers, apostles, prophets, and even people that are deacons in the church or sound guys or guys or whatever, whatever, maintenance people. There are, there's precedent for people that serve in the body of Christ to be full-time. That, they're only supplied through what? Through what the people brought into the temple. So Paul says, just as it happened in the Old Testament, in the same way God has commanded that those who work full-time in the church get their salaries the same way. Who's with me? So you can argue against tithing all you want. It's hard to throw that scripture out. Now oh, Craig, you must go get a job like the rest of us. Okay. I did it for three years. But it's not easy to lead the church of this size and preach every Sunday, do all other things and still have a secular job Monday to Friday. It's just impossible. Yeah. Who's with me? Yeah. Okay, Craig, so we pay for your salary, but what, uh, surely there's nothing else you need to pay for. Don't, don't worry about what you need to pay for. Just be generous. Amen. Just trust God. Yeah. Fat portions of the firstborn. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Not because Craig tells you, because the word speaks to you. Now, you might have been burnt in the past. Hey, Greg, I gave my tithes and the pastor went and embezzled the money. Oh, okay. But don't take the past hurt and shove it into future theology and future theopraxis, orthopraxis, outworking your Christianity. Just as there's false pastors, they must be the real. False prophets, they must be the real. False church, they must be the real. False signs, wonders, there's got to be the real. False Jesuses, there's got to be the real. Amen. Just because you were hurt in the past with something false, don't take that and string it into your future. It's not going to be good for you. 
Who's with me? All right. So let's read quickly. All right. Number one, just a few points and we're done. Number one, what is the tithe? A tithe is 10% of your income given specifically to your local church. That's very simple. That's what it is. Do I have to tithe? Good question. Dave Ramsey, remember I mentioned him a few weeks ago, Dave Ramsey? Listen to this. He says, the Bible tells us that tithing is a way to show that we trust God with our lives and our finances. But the tithe wasn't put in place for God's benefit. He already owns everything. Very, very good point. He doesn't need our money. Instead, tithing is meant for the benefit, for our benefit, because sacrificing a portion of our income, income helps us look outside of our selfishness and makes us more aware of the needs of others and to what God is building. In fact, one of the main purposes of tithing is to support the needs of the pastors or the full-time guys and the work of the local church. Amen? Tithes help pay for the pastor's salary. We have a tithes, offering, a tithes account and an offerings account. We will use them both. Sometimes the offerings account a bit low. We might have to take some money out of that account just to help bolster that to pay for some things. But really want to pay salaries out of the tithes account. But in the holidays, you know, we spent almost eight or... 8,000, 9,000 rand on putting a new geezer in the toilet there so that we have hot water on a Sunday and that the guys can have hot water when they're showering. And three and a half of that came from the other geezer that we managed to, managed to salvage. But we paid four and a half, five thousand rand for that. Amen? We painted the, the boys' toilet that we didn't even use, but for the school, it cost us maybe four and a half thousand rand in total with everything said and done. Who's with me? This whole thing outside you would have cost now probably three and a half thousand rand by the time we finished. Just the plants he bought was 650 bucks yesterday. Who's with me? And we're paying for labor. So everything just adds up. Now we don't go to the school cap in hand. Oh, thanks for the rent to keep it low, please. We don't, can't afford nothing. No, we're going, we're, going, we're going to be a blessing to the school. We've got 10 liters of this paint left. We want to paint some other stuff around the school and do some other things. Maybe get, they, want to, they want to help. They need help. They counsel people. We want to maybe build them a little uh, carpet, them a nice little counseling, counseling office, counseling room. Amen. Yeah. That's where our money goes. Tithes help pay the pastor's salary, keep the church lights on, and meet the needs of the community. Tithing is an act of faith that helps us keep our priorities right. Remember, worship versus giving. It reminds us that we don't own anything in this life. God is in control and we're only managers of what he gives us. 1 Timothy 5, the elders who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those who work who's preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, do not muzzle an ox while it's treading out the grain and the worker deserves his wages. Again, Craig, I don't believe in tithing, it's Old Testament. Well, here Paul is referencing the Corinthian church, he's talking about Old Testament analogies, but yet pulling that into the present and saying, actually, God wants to use the same thing. Don't muzzle the pastors and those who are working full time. Let them eat of whatever they're doing. Who's with me? Some people on Saturday morning were supposed to be here and come and help us. But you know what they thought? Ah, I'm sure there's enough people that will pitch up and help. That's a bad attitude. That's, that's wrong thinking. Why? Because I want to model what it means to do something. Not go, well, I'm sure they'll do it. Really what I'm doing is going, I'm, it's actually a bit of a cop out. And I hope guys pitch up. I just don't want to. <laughs> hope no one phones me. Amen. It's like, man, you can follow me. I'll show you how it's done. I'll be the first to arrive and the last to leave. Amen. Amen. It's more give, blessed to give than to receive. Tithing, well, I'm sure someone else will give for that. You know. <laughs> yeah, but then you're going to miss out on the blessing, sir or ma'am. Don't think like it. Actually, let me model what it means. Let me show you guys. This is what it means to do the right thing. Amen. Almost finished. 1 Corinthians 9, I don't know if I can read the whole thing. Who, deserves as a, who serves as a soldier at his own expense, expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat of it grapes? And there's Paul is just talking about the same thing. He's talking New Testament, New Testament theology here. Going, actually there's precedent for those in the church to receive from the church. I don't even like the word salary because I don't, God doesn't actually, no one pay, God gives me money. Amen. He pays my salary. That's why I'm not stressed. I don't try and manipulate people and even from the beginning because actually, Lord, you're the one who provides for me. 
And if there's no money because people, or there's only, only five people in the church like there was or three people, I go and get a secular job and I work Monday to Friday and plant the church with that. Amen. And pay like Dawn and I did for almost a year. Pay, we pay the rent of the place out of our own money. A thousand a month. Twelve grand. Twelve grand we could have put in our bond or put in something else that we, we paid the rent for, for Grace Life. Amen. Surely the Lord says this for us, doesn't he? Yes, this is written for us. Because whoever plows and threshes should be able to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. I could go on and on for that, about that. Number three, I'm not affiliated with, with a church. Should I still donate 10%? Giving outside of a local church is not tithing but an offering. Because you're given to your storehouse or you're being fed. Very quiet here this morning. I know it's warm, but we're almost done. Should I be tithing while trying to pay off debt? Good question. Glad you asked that. Even, um, if, even if you're in, in debt or walking through a rough financial season, tithing should still be a priority. While it's tempting to throw, away, throw money at our debt, the discipline and faith that tithing brings is so worth it. Even while you're paying down debt, you can still have an attitude of giving and be generous. If you think it'll take a miracle to get you through a month with, less than, less, with 10% less in your wallet, you might need to do a lifestyle check. Take a look at your budget and find ways to cut back uh, on spending. Now, that might mean reducing some of your fun money or packing your own lunch. I can tell you, my friends, tithers have testimonies. Tithers have testimonies. You take 100% for the next year and you say, I'm going to give 10% of my salary. I promise you, you'll see at the end of the year that God made that 100% go way further, or that 90, sorry, that you could ever make the 100% go. That comes to do with our time as well. One day I'm going to talk about tithing our time and you see how bad a lot of us are. 168 hours a week, 16.8 hours, that's 10%. How much time do you give God? Eee, one hour on a Sunday morning. You owe God 15 hours. Okay, well, I sleep, I sleep eight hours a day, Craig. I promise you, you'll still owe God, owe God a lot of time. Amen? We, we sow, we reap we, what we sow. We reap what we sow. If we, get, if we sow time, God will give us time back. Sow finances, he gives us finances back. Who's with me? We reap what we sow. I don't have time for that. Those guys that came here yesterday, thank you. Some people spend five, six hours here of their Saturday. They tithed, they gave some of their time towards their time that God has. God has given us every day. Amen? Whoa, okay. Do I give 10% before my tax or after? Do I factor in income from side hustles? Be a giver. Don't be a penny pincher. Amen. Oh, it's before tax, off tax, hold on. Ooh, okay, there's... Man, just be generous. Be generous. In, 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 in 13 years, we've given as, as a church almost 1.3 million rand away. In, fine, in hard money, in food, in blessing people with things. Now, we're not doing it to blow our trumpet. We're saying, you can't outgive God. We cannot outgive Him. Amen. And what happens when we tithe? There's no curse on us, my friends. Malachi tells us the blessing. Listen, when you bring your money into the storehouse, your tithe, bring all the tithes into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. See, food in my house that we can have sustenance on in the house of God. Then he says, uh, um, in my house, and test me now in this. There's no other place in the Bible where God says, test me. Test me is actually a bad thing. Here he says, test me, son or daughter if I will not open up the, the windows of heaven for you and pour out so much of a, such a great blessing until there is no more room for it then I will rebuke the devourer insects or plague this is amplified for, the, for your sake and it will not destroy the fruits of your ground nor will your vine in your field drop its grapes before I came back to the Lord I wasn't doing anything I wasn't even serving God and friends I felt like money was sometimes sand through my hands I could never really do it, it, it I never had enough money and I was always struggling financially amen and then I started stepping into what God calls me to step into. Now, do, I, do, do we always have more than enough? No, sometimes we have just enough. Yeah. Amen. Amen. But God has never dropped us. Come on. Never, ever, ever. And we have tired for 20 years. Yeah. Before I met Dawn, before she met me, and when we've been together. Yeah. And He will be, He will plug up the holes and stop the devourer from coming and taking what is yours. Because you put Him first. Amen. Amen. With the fat portions. The good portions, the 10%, the first portion. I love that. All nations shall call you happy and blessed. 
for you shall be a land of delight. And then my last scripture and we're done. Why don't we stand, stand together? Can I get the, some of the worship team, the, if you don't mind, I don't know where you guys are, if you're around, Trev. Thanks, Sean. Listen to this one, my last scripture. Moreover, as you Philippians know, early in the days, uh, days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in this matter of giving and receiving except you only. That is a massive indictment. Amen. Lord, don't let it be that I am like that, that actually other people do it, but not me. Not one church shared with me in this matter of giving and receiving except you, Philippian church. Lord, don't let it be said that actually I'm part of the not one except this other person. Let me be that part of that other person. Amen. Even when I was in need, when I was in Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is, is that more be credited to your account. How's that? So it's not that I desire your gift. It's not that, I'm, it's not that we as a leadership of grace are come on, uh, give it. No, no, no. Actually, what's going to be credited to you? That's important. And clearly, of course, your generosity supplies what we need. Amen? And they're not just, okay, well, Craig, what do you need? And many years ago, when we were still a lot smaller, and we were in another venue, someone came to you after and said, what, can't you put like a budget together of what you guys need, and then we can kind of give towards that? Man, I'm like, are you are being for real? Does your boss come to you and say, what, how much money do you need in a month? I need this, okay, I'll give you that. No, you, you pay your salary and you do whatever you need to do. There's a lot more than we need, just here's the budget. Man, we, we want to do lots of other stuff. Don't look for ways to be le giving less. Look for ways to give more. Amen. And then he says, uh, not that I desire. I have received full payment and have more than enough. Well, then you should stop asking Paul. This is Paul the Apostle, sent from God. I am amply supplied now that I received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. But he's still saying, but continue to be good with what you said you're going to give. Not for my sake, though, for yours. Then he says, They are a fragrant offering, my friends, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. That's what happens when we bring our, our sacrifice. And he says, And my God, let's say that together, verse, verse something, number 19. And my God, see, when we are sowing into the purpose of God, sowing into the purpose of God, not bad seed. seed. Paul the Apostle was very good seed at that time, I can promise you. People sowing into Paul's life were sowing into very good seed. We realize now, 2,000 years later, he wrote 75% of the New Testament. And he says, And my God, let's read this together, will meet all your needs according to his riches and glory. You need your needs met? Yes, I do, Craig. And start to give it to the purpose and plans of God. Start tithing. If it's not 10%, Craig, I can't it. Then start at 2%. with confidence knowing how God has used your generosity in your life 